You're listening to Body IO FM with your hosts, Kiefer and Dr. Rocky, where cutting edge science meets the razor's edge of health and performance. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Body IO FM. This is your host, Kiefer, and co host, Dr. Rocky. Hello, Kiefer. And um, and we also have Alex Moore in studio today. Howdy. Our, our resident research uh, analyst, I guess, at the moment. And uh, we o- almost always comment on our sponsor, which I forgot a couple podcasts ago, uh, High Lead Athletic Wear. Uh, thanks again for your support. We appreciate it. And on today's show, uh, we have Dr. Bill Lagakis. Is that, did I get it right? That's perfect. Yep, that was perfect. Awesome. Uh, he, he actually, he caught my interest because even though there have been at least 101 critiques of car backloading ever since I put out the book, uh, I, you know, I thought his did the best job of actually uh, applying research rather well and finding some of the weaknesses that I've tried to address in podcasts and articles over the years. Uh, and it, it was not a polemic and it was clear that he actually read the book, which I think might be the first time I've read a critique <laughs> where the person clearly read the book. Um, so, so Bill, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad I read that book and I recommend it. It's got, it's full of pearls. It's a, it's a great program. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. I thought, you know, you had an, a nice even handed commentary on it and, uh, you know, some of the, some of the things are, are things that I've discussed as weaknesses before and. You know, I, I think you make, made some valid points that are that are worthy of debate. Whether we we do that on this show or not is a you know we'll we'll find out as we go. But uh, I actually appreciated that critique, uh, so I just wanted to to let you know that I thought I thought it was a good cr- critique, and you had some valid oh. points. So thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, it was really really nice that I could tell you read the book instead. <laughs> <laughs> so that was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, so can you, you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work, uh, you know, even kind of how you got onto, you know, the, the public scene. I know you've actually got a couple books on Kindle. Um, but yeah, you know. so, I mean, I've just been all into nutrition. I have the blog calories proper. Uh, when I wrote my first book, the poor misunderstood calorie, that was just sort of like, you know, everything I knew I learned through, through school, how to apply things sort of like the basics of all things nutrition. I wanted to translate it to something that was very readable. And my blog is kind of like an extension of that. It's just when something comes in the news and it's nutrition related and I want to talk about it or if a study is published or I get my hands on a book like yours and want to talk about it, that's sort of what I I use the blog for. Okay, can you, so in um, A Poor Misunderstood Calorie, which is a, a great name by the way, uh, what, Thanks. yeah, I, I love that name. It so what was it that you covered in that? Uh, cause we actually, we just did a podcast recently where we talked a lot about calories in calories out, and even what calories mm-hmm. mean, uh, which is misinterpreted right. a lot today. So wh- what did the book cover? I have to admit, I, I unfortunately only learned that you had it recently, so I haven't had a chance to read it. Okay. So it's basically, you know, of course I do all the, the basics of defining the calorie calories in food versus calories in energy expenditure and calories as units of heat. But then I try and use most of the book to show how hormones and sort of the neuroendocrine response to foods, how that determines uh, the effects of you know, energy balance and on nutrient partitioning. So you could, you know, in some examples, it's feeding two different diets, same number of calories, but then seeing how it could have different effects on body composition. And other, you know, I tried to pull from a wide variety of examples, like even some drug studies where one treatment group is getting some, you know, new experimental, I don't know, growth hormone drug, for example, and just showing how that different hormonal alteration can alter the way the body partitions nutrients into muscle versus fat. And just trying to get the point across that it's not all about the calories, there's, you know, more important things going on that determine how your body is going to partition uh, nutrients into muscle and fat. Yeah, it's it's interesting that that's lost so much in in some of the conversation today because essentially, you know, what you're and correct me if I'm wrong, 
Uh, you're basically, instead of focusing on the first law of thermodynamics that a lot of people like to throw around, even though they, they don't understand it's not very useful, you're kind of extending that second law, showing that if you change the environment, that changes right. the processes that are going to happen because of the things you've introduced. Yeah, human biology is a dynamic system. Yeah, it's... And, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's complicated, and the bomb calorimeter argument is is great, and I'm not going to say it's wrong, but it just, you know, uh, endocrinology and, and the hormones at play when people are, you know, changing their diet or changing their lifestyle habits, they seem to be, you know, that warrant our attention. Yeah, and I think it, at least from the vast amount of research I've seen, uh, it's very clear that, like you just said, making those the transitional periods is where we see some of the most interesting things. And the hard part is is knowing, you know, what what state the body will eventually settle into because, you know, these transition states are definitely not normal mm -hmm. states that right, the body will be. Yeah. Right, Right. So we would expect, I would expect to see fluctuations, uh, and I think we do, uh, both up and down is just, you know, you can't just assume that the body is so simple and then it's energy in, energy out, and then ignore everything else. And like, who cares what's going on inside the body? None of that matters. Right, right. Absolutely. So, so have you, ha are you, is there anything of particular interest to you at the moment? You said you like to, you know, whatever's in the news or uh, if the new studies well, come right out. right now I'm still, comment. Uh, I'm extending my initial blog post on carb backloading and, you know, I'm still pretty, I, I love the idea underlying it, you know, doing things at different times of day because insulin sensitivity varies by time of day. Mm -hmm. So I've still been pretty uh, interested in that, working through some, some concepts and ideas. Okay. Uh, the, so the one thing I, I've got to ask when you, the one study by SOD, uh, which I've seen a couple times and I've seen some other things where people have actually used that to say that, you know, maybe I have the rhythm backwards, uh, you know, their, their average BMI there was overweight. And we know as people, wait, can you tell, wait, which study is this? Uh, I think it was sod is the first one you said where they, uh, it's one of the first studies you talk about in the critique. Okay. And you said we have a, a, a ah, direct yes. measure of, yeah, insulin sensitivity based on, um, meal load at different times of the day. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious there, you know, the averages we see are what we see that's indicative of people who are overweight and their selection mm -hmm. criteria was pretty broad. Uh, so, you know, my question there is we, we have what's known as the insulin paradox, where as people become more and more overweight, their insulin sensitivity actually shifts and they do become more insulin sensitive in the evening rather than the morning. Uh, and they call that the okay. insulin paradox. So I'm, I'm just kind of curious if, uh, you're aware of that? Well, or? I, I didn't know about that. I didn't know about that, but I think this, the sod paper also confirms sort of some of the theories in CBL. It's, right. It shows it was, that in this population, the glucose clearance was better in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was in, in the sod paper. Right. It was. Uh, I I just felt like it was, um, you know, a little bit maybe light handed, like you know it. It just because it had such a spread across different BMIs, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure, you know, for me, the necessarily the applicability of that. I know I've, I've seen that in other right. critiques. They're, they pretty much, you know, my, my take is like every, as you increase adiposity, you know, every things start to change radically. And so we, oh, yeah, we, absolutely. Yeah, we really need to keep that in context, which, uh, you know, is lost in a lot of the conversations. Um, I, f I did find a couple studies that showed something pretty similar in a variety of contexts that people will experience. I, I didn't come across that insulin paradox uh, study uh, studies. I will look for those. Okay. But I did find a lot that shows muscle will take up more glucose more readily in the mornings. Okay, but it was the adipose tissue. I think later on you showed that there was yes, a that, that's why that's the difference. Decrease. It so, seems like you know. Oh, go ahead. For your listeners, or who are probably very savvy on this, and I, I apologize if everybody's aware of this. When you talk about insulin sensitivity, it's not sort of it doesn't mean the same thing in every tissue in the body. Right. As we were just talking about for skeletal muscle, it means you know glucose clearance. That's one of the most important things. For the liver, it's you expose the liver to insulin. We want suppression of hepatic glucose production. And for adipose tissue, uh, insulin seems to have a, 
anti-lipolytic or it enhances fatty acid uptake. So for the blood measure, at when you know your participants are exposed to insulin, we like to see suppression of free fatty acids, to, and that's an indicator of adipose tissue insulin sensitivity. Okay, does that so would that I've also seen work that shows if you introduce uh, carbohydrates earlier in the day that you affect uh, lipolysis later in the day, so you actually get a suppression. Uh, could that skew results possibly? Because in that, I don't think they had, you know, a mix where they introduced carbohydrates early in the day, and then on another day they didn't introduce carbohydrates. They only introduced right. them in the evening to see what the differences were. Uh, it, it didn't really right. cover that. I mean, one thing I admit readily, and one thing that you definitely showed in your critique, is there a lot of research that we're missing that needs to be done in these areas. Mm -hmm. So and it's, and it's pain, it's painfully nuanced. Right. I mean, if we try and, if we try and like compare two studies, like you mentioned earlier, the, the patient population, you know, and now I'm, I'm trying to find all these different studies where they're altering <laughs> meal timing and it's like, crap, this one's at 8am. They have breakfast. This one's at 9am and right. dinner time varies from, from 3pm to 9pm. So it's very difficult to sort of assimilate all this into into a coherent structure. Yes. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, the, the basis of it, I just kind of stumbled on and I've been going down rabbit holes ever since. Uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. even I admit there's there's so many kind of nuances around this. And it looks like Rocky wants to say something. Well, I was just going to say you had mentioned earlier about this one SOD study and looking at BMI. Um, depending on which protocol you're, you're talking about, whether it's carbonite versus carb backloading, um, you have to look at the patient population that's applying that program, right? And obviously, if you're carb backloading, and let's say, I'm, I'm just going to use BMI just because, you know, it's, it's convention. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if your BMI is 30 versus BMI of 21, you know, obviously, that diet protocol is going to have probably two different effects. Yeah, very definitely so. Mm -hmm. so, so the carb night solution is sort of, Car backloading, but maybe once a week or once every other week. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To, okay. Do you have a copy of that one? I do not. Okay, I'll be happy to send that to you after the show so you can check it out oh, too. Cool. But keep in mind, I wrote it 10 years ago now, so I definitely need to update that one as well. Okay. But I welcome any critiques. Sure, um, sure. So I, now you've got me really curious. I'm like, I'm a little derailed because like, okay, I'm actually going to add to the car backloading post. So I'm kind of curious <laughs> what it is you're well, looking I, I've, into at the moment. I've if you don't mind talking about it. A lot of this. Sure, sure. I, I'm very interested. Like one of my side interests, like every other blog that I write is about sort of circadian biology. So I do like to see things that change uh, on a diurnal rhythm. And this adipose tissue insulin sensitivity seems to be effective. It, I'm not really entirely sure if it's just due to the other factors, such as you're awake and walking around, so you have more sympathetic nervous system activation during the day, as opposed to, you know, when you're sleeping, obviously, mm -hmm. it would be lower. So, and it seems that adipose tissue, I mentioned this in the first blog on CBL, it's, it kind of goes in the opposite direction. It, it is, adipose tissue insulin sensitivity seems to increase a little bit as the day progresses. It goes in the opposite direction of skeletal muscle. And I say that sort of cautiously because, again, the studies that I'm looking at, it's, they all express the data in different ways, and it's all, they're all very nuanced. And so right. sometimes it's hard to determine if we're actually observing adipose tissue insulin sensitivity or our free fatty acids lower because they're being cleared faster. So right. it's, you know, and it's, then the, also the bear. population being looked at as well. I didn't, I didn't right. actually get a chance to look at the – because I – I didn't, uh, wasn't able to pull that paper in time for this podcast, but the one where they looked at uh, free fatty acid clearance uh, in the evening opposed to the morning, I didn't get to see what that population was made up of, like what their mm -hmm. essential health or BMI was or anything like that. So I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if maybe it was an example of, you know, potentially the insulin paradox. Um, right. And, I can that in mind. Yeah, I'll send you some... I'll, I'll send you some uh, references to those so you can that can start your start your look into okay, that. Okay, cool. Um, what was I? I totally derailed myself. Now, what are you gonna say? I that, I mean, what you just said, I was alluding to. You probably said a little bit more eloquently, but in terms of the population you're looking at, I think that's such a crucial thing. And when you have um, um, people online, so to speak, 
saying, well, this is complete baloney because it didn't work for them or right. it didn't work for their clients. Magic, as I believe yeah. Aaron, Alan Aragon likes to call yeah. it. <laughs> that you have, to, <laughs> you have to look at the population that you're applying that plan, uh, that, that the application to. I mean, that's huge. I mean, so, so Bill, I'm, mm-hmm. a, I'm a family physician. So, you know, my population skewed toward the other end of the spectrum. You know, I, I see lots of insulin resistance and diabetes mm-hmm. and impaired glucose tolerance. And so, you know, CBL for my patient population probably isn't the best protocol for them. Um, right, but, but right. you know, things like carb night where that, that exposure is limited and pre- periodic goes a long way in terms of helping them get healthier and losing weight and improving their, mm-hmm. their risk markers. So um, and in, in my personal instance, I was able to sh- show some regression of atherosclerosis as well. So I, I think that, That's again, what, again, what you had, I think what gets lost in a shuffle with um, interpreting these type of, uh, you know, things is that, y- again, that that population, it, it gets lost. I think we were trying to mm-hmm. apply this to a general population and it's it's got to be mm-hmm. done, I think, in a specific sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, That's something the, I didn't really take into account. I, I'm, I just pulled up one of the papers where I have where they compared 7 a.m. breakfast to a 9 p.m. dinner, and I thought the study design was great, but now I'm looking through it again. Oh, it's in gestational diabetes, which is, right. you know, so, you know, come on. Right. So, yeah, and, it's, and that's, that's why, you know, I always make it clear, and, like, I should have made that more clear in the beginning of all my books. Like, you know, this this is the best I have and the best framework I have based on the the information that's available and there's still a lot of things that need to be addressed. And the problem is usually when we address them, we address them in sick populations or metabolically deranged and we don't address them in healthier people who work out, which could be an entirely different world. And we know that from kind of the calories in calories out thing is interesting. If you only work with athletes, they actually have a, a pretty well done study and then a review of some Articles that show if somebody is a highly trained athlete, it almost doesn't matter the composition of their diet. If you put them in an energy right. deficit or if you put them in an energy excess, they gain the same type of weight and the same amount of weight. Like it almost doesn't matter what they eat. So when you have mm-hmm. people who only work with athletes talking about, well, only calories in, calories out, you know, their experience it makes sense in their yeah, context. Exactly. Their yeah. experience is completely skewed. So you would expect them to say that. And they just never mm-hmm. step outside of that population to to maybe look at these deviations. I mean, I I love finding problems with my protocols because that just means I'm gonna learn more. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Great attitude. Yeah, thanks. Well that that again, that's why I said I you know, I enjoyed your critique because I you know, I think it made some salient points where everybody else is just like, Oh, well that's stupid and he said that Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, if you work out then you do then you produce less insulin than normal. I was like, Where did I ever say that? You know, all kinds of weird comments mm-hmm. and that are pretty much useless. So mm-hmm. So I'm still curious. So so I'm I'm glad to hear that you're digging into the circadian rhythm of different things. What have you have you have you found something, you know, of monumental interest no so far not monumental. <laughs> i can say that with very with high confidence what i'm sort of there's no great you know study that's tested this directly so i'm sort of trying to piece together things from different you know take one observation that was made in this study one observation made in this study and seeing if it all goes together and makes sense well so i have and to it, ask so what oh go ahead sorry Oh, and, you know, and then seeing if, if these little studies about adipose tissue insulin sensitivity, if then I can see if that corroborates or if that is, you know, something similar in a longer term feeding study. So trying to pair the acute situation to the, you know, well, how would this work out in like a 12 week program or something? Okay. So, you know, I just have to ask, cause your education is, you know, from a, I'll just say a traditional institution, you know, you would have had the same, I assume, um, kind of exposure to what a balanced diet is supposed to be, so on and so forth. What mm-hmm. what got you, you know, interested to kind of start to deviate from those classical notions? Because you you mm-hmm. clear you clearly are not tied to that, you know, uh, paradigm. So you know, I because mm-hmm. I mean, I can actually get asked yeah. this a lot, and I think that what I, w- I was a you know a lab sci- a laboratory scientist. And it wasn't really dietitian training, so we were more learning, you know, molecular biology, biochemistry. I just happened to have a, a side interest, a passion in, you know, 
human nutrition and, and exercise performance. So I guess, I don't know, I wasn't subjected to too many of the biases, you know, the low fat diet and the, whatever, the heart healthy diet paradigm. Either okay. that or I just miraculously avoided it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think you might have miraculously avoided it. Uh, okay. It sounds like. But no, that you know, that's, that's interesting. So to the exercise performance, a question I have for you. You in your recommendation and your critique is that if you wanted to try to avoid uh, the storage of carbohydrates as in adipose tissue, however that is, whether it's de novo lipogenesis or, you know, incorporation into the glycerol part of the, the molecule, mm-hmm. that you should eat your carbohydrates before working out. So I, that, I'm totally on the opposite side of that. that. Yeah, I know. I know you are. And yeah. I, don't, I don't feel very strongly about that. I mean, I see it being... Not, it's not going to make or break your program if you eat the carbs 40 minutes earlier or 40 minutes later. Uh, and I do appreciate the impact of exercising in the fasted state would have. You'd have mm-hmm. elevated lipolysis, maybe some increased autonomic nervous system activation. I mean, I don't feel right. very strongly towards it. I'm just thinking that, you know, maybe to preserve a little bit of lean mass, if having a, an amino, amino acid supply from like a small dose of protein before the workout Mm-hmm. That might be helpful to offset some of the, the lean mass burning. But again, I'm not really too set in stone on this idea. Well, you're, you're actually somebody that I can present this to who probably has a, a good opinion on it. Because again, I'm on some of these things, I'm flying with very, very limited information. Uh, so, you know, I had mistakenly thought when I was looking into it, I, I found a few studies that showed if you have low insulin levels and low lower blood glucose levels going into training, um, your muscles are more sensitive to adrenaline. Uh, you actually get a more rapid release of adrenaline and you get a bigger release of adrenaline. And I saw this as some sort of super physiological state. And what I realized mm-hmm. is it might actually be the base state that you would want because uh, in order to fully access and mobilize intramuscular glycogen stores, that relies heavily on uh, muscular sensitivity to the catecholamines, so like adrenaline. So, you know, what, I, what I'd missed the first time around is that's probably the base mechanism that we want to activate. We don't want to have carbohydrates readily available from recently ingested food. If we keep that yeah. out, then we get direct access and better access and faster mobilization of the intramuscular glycogen stores. Now, unfortunately, what I don't have are any direct studies comparing uh, performance over the short term in this, you know, switching from carbs before training to, you know, just making sure glycogen levels are full uh, before right. training. I mean, there's, pro- there's probably some sort of like low intensity cycling studies but that's not really right. what yeah. our interest is. Exactly. Because I, you know, I kind of want to know about some glycogen depleting processes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was just, I was wondering what your take is on that because, you know, like I said, I, I can piece all this information together, but there's no direct studies. So, you know, mm-hmm. what is your take on that compared I would to? Say, that sounds reasonable. That sounds very reasonable. The, my, uh, I mean, for increased intensity. And I guess at this point, we're probably also talking about two different patient populations Um, uh, because that's sort of like someone at the higher end of the athletic spectrum is trying to, you know, ratchet up the intensity to lift bigger and stronger weights. Mm -hmm. Whereas I was looking at it from the perspective of, well, if you do have the calories and the carbohydrates pre-workout, the increased sympathetic nervous system can sort of attenuate that insulin spike a little bit. And for the goal, the goal in this population would be probably low overall insulin levels as much as possible. Right. Yeah. So and I, not the strength athlete. Yeah. And I, I think normally when we do have carbs, which is pretty much the, you know, used to be the universal recommendation is, you know, having those carbs pre-workout is that's where we see that competition between the, the stress hormones like adrenaline and the insulin. So neither mm-hmm. one can actually do its job very effectively. And right, that it, makes sense. Yeah. And I've, I've noticed that in a lot of populations, like I said, I don't, I don't have research or clinical trials on this yet, but a lot of people report, you know, within the first few days or first week of carb backloading, they see very noticeable increases in strength. And that that could be entirely due to the higher sensitivity to adrenaline during the workout. 
Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It's my my guess. Yeah. So that that's the only that that would be where I would deviate from you know recommending carb. That's that's one of the main reasons I recommend no carbs before training in particular uh, mm -hmm. is for that reasoning and, and not just, you know, all the rhythms and everything else, but you, you do get a performance advantage. And I think, you know, there's also some, you can make some speculations based on some of the glycogen recompensation studies and glycogen levels, pre-training and all that kind of stuff. You, you could argue that the glycogen level and being able to deplete the glycogen stores internally can help preserve muscle tissue as much or better than trying to introduce like amino acids or things like that. And again, we need better research in this direction, but there, there, there are clues pointing that way at the moment. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Glycogen burn it when you can. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Are, are you, <clears throat> so I don't know, are you familiar with uh, Brad Schoenfeld's and Alan Aragon's review of post workout nutrition? No. Have you read that? Oh, uh, they basically th go through and critique, you know, is it even valuable to eat protein post-workout, pre-workout, during the workout? Uh, and they also mm -hmm. try to tackle carbohydrates uh, post-workout and say, well, there's really no advantage to doing that. And uh, huh. yeah, and so what I, what I found was interesting, and I don't know if you know about this line of research, but the NMR studies of glycogen repletion post-exercise – Okay. Are you, are you aware of these studies? Because no. they didn't mention them in the review at all. And well, my, my guess would be you can probably replete glycogen pretty quick if you have a meal post-workout. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the NMR studies are great, and I think they didn't mention them because it would kind of disprove what they were trying to say. You know, the NMR studies are like real – we can see real-time recompensation, and – we can actually look at how – like what the major factors are in those, and there's some great studies that show – there's a 30 minute window, 30 minutes to 45 minutes, you know, that's an average immediately post workout where the glycogen repletion is completely insulin independent. And then what we see after okay. that, yeah, is after that for the next two to three hours, glycogen repletion is completely insulin dependent. So we actually have a very small window of opportunity mm -hmm. for that non insulin mediated glute four translocation. Uh, to get an advantage out of that. So that very distinctly shows, you know, you need to ingest the carbohydrates immediately post-workout if you're looking for that mm -hmm. glycogen repletion. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm actually, so, I, uh, oh, go ahead. Regardless of what their conclusion is, I bet you that both of those guys have a post-workout, you know, protein shake with some carbohydrates. <laughs> yeah, I would bet they do too. I bet you they do it. Yeah. It, I mean, <laughs> I, I know that the, the, the nutrient timing studies None of them are very compelling, whether they're comparing morning protein to evening protein or pre-workout to post-workout. They all seem to suggest a slight benefit with, you know, consuming a meal around workout time. But I don't, you know, the studies aren't showing it's going to be a make it or break it thing. Right. But for myself personally, I want to just stack the odds in your favor. Yeah, I, I actually kind of feel the same way. And, you know, I think there's enough compelling rationale to do it. You know, let alone right. of can we sh can we show and no some, reason not to? Yes, exactly, and that's what I thought the review showed. But you know, at the end, their conclusion was, "Well, eat whatever you want, whenever you want. It doesn't matter," which I thought was right. a very bad conclusion from <laughs> from right, right. from the available information that's out there. So when you were doing, you said you were you were actually uh, you know doing research. You were a researcher, so you were able to avoid a lot of the you know, food pyramid stuff. What, what was your active when, when you were up? Uh, well, just what was your PhD work basically? Um, well, my PhD work is not very exciting. Oh. Just working with, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, all, all animal models, all animal work, you know, working with the study on the absorption and, in, uh, intestinal metabolism of dietary fats. Oh, okay. Do you uh, have how any, how they're solubilized, mm -hmm. how you and how they are transported across the intestinal cells. And I was working with two proteins that we still really think are involved in the process because how else are these, you know, lipids going to get across the aqueous cytoplasm? But mm -hmm. wasn't really be able wasn't really able to find proof that they were involved using a couple different uh, animal knockout models. Oh, so is there anything usable we can translate 
from from that into our <laughs> own like ingestion of fat because obviously I recommend a lot of fat in my dietary protocols. So yeah, not really. I mean, the stuff <laughs> I learned was that di- we are extremely good at absorbing fat. I mean, you could probably eat a pound of butter and absorb every last gram of it. Wow. What the so, body does not will not waste any fat. So, do you think there's an upper limit to that? Because I always, I mean, we had a guy on the forums, and the reason I asked this is we had a guy in the forums. I don't know, maybe a year ago, two years ago, who was trying to eat, you know, like I don't know what it was, some ridiculous amount of protein, and so he was trying to balance that with uh, two times the amount of fat, and so he was he was ha- consuming literally like six thousand calories of oil is what he decided to use a lot of olive oil and what was funny was after a month of this he complained because he didn't lose any weight but he hadn't gained any weight so yeah instantly i'm gonna say i'm gonna guess he did absorb all that there there was one study from like 70 years ago and they just were giving a guy 500 grams a day and they were recovering none of it in the feces wow so if this guy's doing more than that, or in that <laughs> ballpark. Wow, that's amazing. It's that is getting absorbed. I would not have imagined that we have the capacity to absorb that much lipid. It's a lot of it's a lot of redundancy. There's you know there's like ten different enzymes that all do the same thing. So if somebody has a polymorphism where they have slightly lesser activity or more activity, it's all going to balance out. And it seems like I don't know, we just well, evolved to not waste any fat. Wow. So we almost have no, there's no rate limiting step there. We're going to pretty much absorb it. And then the body's got to figure out what to do with it. Yes. Bill, I have a question. Is there a, a, like a preference and type of fat that the, uh, that the body absorbs or is it all kind of the same, all kind of linear? Uh, it's not, it's not linear. And we tend to absorb the longer the chain of the fatty acid and the more saturated it is, the less well we absorb it. So you can get like a 20, you can get like behenic acid, which is something like over 20 carbons long, fully saturated. And the absorption of that is very low. Uh, and they're also, they're very quick to form like, you know, calcium soaps. If you, if you have a lot of. So like, what's the discrepancy then? We'll absorb like oleic acid from olive oil. Uh, they're not very soluble. Huh. I mean, okay. in the lumen of your stomach in the lumen of your intestine, uh, they have to be solubilized in order because, you know, otherwise they're not going to be able to float through the aqueous uh, water phase. And the long chain saturated ones are less soluble. Oh, huh, that's interesting. And like o- oleic acid is like, you know, the model that is very well absorbed. So in other words, drinking all that olive oil, he should have been able to absorb a vast quantity of, of that. Wow. My guess is yes. I, did he complain of, you know, hot flashes? No, you know, he didn't give a lot of details. He was just bitching because he hadn't lost any weight. So we didn't, we didn't have a lot of details of what happened to him because he didn't, when, when people weren't necessarily very sympathetic to his problem. So it didn't give him an opportunity to, to really voice what was going on, but he could have, wow. I, I almost, th- that's kind of boggling my mind a little bit. Cause I just thought, you know, there's gotta be some saturation point where we just, there could, there could be. I mm-hmm. mean, it hasn't really been very rigorously studied. And, you know, my studies in mice confirmed that, that they will absorb almost all of it. And then there was that one human study. So basically, if there is a saturation point, it's really high. Right. What, what kind of quantities were you talking about in that human study? Uh, 500 mm-hmm. grams, so maybe a pound. And was that, that in a single feeding? That was in a single feeding, and I believe it was butter. Holy crap. That's yeah, yeah. How did they get the, I, they I wonder how they got the. Kind, they don't do that kind of stuff anymore. <laughs> I, I wonder how they got the ago. participants yeah. to even eat that. <laughs> well, yeah, that. I think if it was in an acute setting, you know, if they're telling them to do it very quickly, they're not going to have time to get nauseous from all the calories. Right. Whereas if they told them, you know, take your time and eat this butter over the course of an hour, I imagine 30 minutes into it, they're going to be pretty disgusted at the thought of food. <laughs> I'd say. That's amazing. So I, I've got some, so this is also speculative stuff. And you might be a very good person to 
to discuss this. So we, you know, usually when you ingest fats, it takes a while for the fatty acids to be available um, in the bloodstream for usage. You know, they've got got to go through the lymphatic system and it takes a, a while mm-hmm. to actually be available uh, other than MCTs or some other, you know, special exotic kind of things. Um, but, you know, even with a mixed meal that contains a lot of fat, we usually see a pretty quick rise in fatty acids. And I always questioned that because I didn't understand how that happened. And then I saw a little bit of research about how there were mechanisms for actually the special cells, not necessarily even fat cells around the intestinal tract to store some of the lipids. And then basically, so every time you eat, it releases some of those mm-hmm. lipids into circulation. Did I? Yeah, this is this is new stuff, and you interpreted okay. it exactly correctly. A lot of that work was done by Elizabeth Parks, and like the second oh. meal effect. Like if you feed one particular type of fat with breakfast, and you know measure the fatty acids in the blood, if you then feed a different fat for lunch and measure the fatty acids in the blood, there'll be an initial peak, but that'll be with the fatty acids, like the breakfast fatty acids. Uh-huh. And then the you know more delayed peak, that's the launch. That's very interesting. And the, the intestinal lipid droplets is sort of like a new field. Yeah, I, I was very curious because they were in the review I read of some of the research. They said, you know, that you could possibly see some of some of that effect from as long as three days later, which made me wow. think, yeah, there's almost, you know, there's almost no reason. I initially made recommendations with carb backloading and carb nights. Like, well, you know, if you want to, prevent rise in fatty acids with a meal, you know, also backload your fat, you know, so have lower fat for the first couple meals and then save mm-hmm. the fat for later. But I don't, I don't know if that really matters at all. <laughs> yeah. That, that brings up a, a very interesting point about timing of, of fat intake. Yeah. Fat, fat to me is like so complex in all the different functions it yeah. It carries out and then the different ways we absorb it, the different ways we release it, the, you know, the different ways we store it. It's, mm-hmm. it, it is such a complex piece of the puzzle. And unfortunately it like gets ignored so much because we're always interfering with uh, how the system's going to react by introducing a lot of carbohydrates. So once insulin's in mm-hmm. play, all kinds of things change. Right. Yeah, this is interesting. And I'm going to have to think about this. <laughs> well, so there was a- when you say oh. carb back, when you say, you know, fat backloading, that means no fat immediately post-workout? Right, exactly. My, my initial thought was, okay. and I, I've changed this thinking, uh, my initial thought was that you should, if we're only looking at what's happening during the meal, it might be ideal to have your fat later because we know there's a, de- a delay in mm-hmm. when you have fatty a- free fatty acid rise in the blood from a meal. So if you mm-hmm. don't have the fats initially... When you do have the fats, even though they're with a mixed meal, then those fats are going to be available after you're asleep and the insulin levels have already started to subside, was my theory. But I don't think that holds water anymore at all when I learned about this. Right, because now whether or not you eat the fat, you're getting the initial spike from the intestinal lipid. Yep, exactly. So if you've had- that makes sense. Yeah, if you've had fat in the last three days, basically there's no reason to, yeah, alter your, when you eat your- your fat with your carbohydrates. It's just really not going to matter very much. That's the easiest plan. Just have all mixed meals. <laughs> right. Right. It seems like that'd be a lot more fun as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can I have can your, get on board. Yeah. You can have your cinnamon roll with the cream cheese icing. You don't need to do it without. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and you know, I've, these second meal effects have also kind of fascinated me recently because uh, not only with, the, the fat stuff, you know, I had, it, it, and it also, so this will play heavily into um, maybe even your next critique of carb backloading as you look at these things. So I found some studies and I can, I can send this one to you too. It was very interesting. They showed that the, uh, basically the uh, insulin index of the meal you eat before going to bed will predict and affect the insulin release you have of, of your breakfast the next morning. So if you have a very high insulin anotropic food before going to bed, your insulin response in the morning is higher than somebody who had basically a low insulin release before bed, which also then starts to skew some of the things you look at for, for the circadian rhythms of what, what's mm-hmm. ideal. Right. And, and how, and 
how long were the with the was the population that we're talking about? How long were they fasted between dinner and breakfast? Huh. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's why you know I I guess like, in the car and the yeah in the, in the CBL protocol that probably wouldn't matter because you know we're not eating breakfast. Exactly. Yeah, that's kind of the idea. Or or at the very least, we're not eating any carbohydrates at breakfast. And unfortunately, I haven't seen any studies that looked at the insulin response to say, you know, something like bacon first thing in the morning if you had right. a, a high insulin response right before bed because it, it could ideally affect that as well. And I, you know, I don't know. And right. if it if it does, then the, there definitely needs to be some modifications of some of my recommendations for going for the junk because you get the biggest insulin response. Mm -hmm. I would say if it is to bacon, we'd still be in a completely different ballpark than mm -hmm. compared to like toast. Right. Right. Yeah, I would agree. So, so, you know, it might there basically, you know, I have accidentally in a couple of ways. So I learned all this information after I published CBL, unfortunately it, but you know, what's, mm -hmm. What's interesting is some of the things I did might actually create the ideal circadian rhythm that we're looking for just because of the way you're forcing the body to now produce different responses at different times of the day. Hmm. That's interesting. So, in, so in that scenario, depending on what you think you may eat for breakfast the following day, <laughs> then it may be more advantageous to place the junk earlier in the back load than in the end of the back load. Or would that not timing make a difference? I don't know if that timing, like I said, you know, we've got like one, one really decent study on this. So I, you know, I don't even know Wait, how big. Hold on. Oh, go ahead. What's the back, the back load is like the two or three hours immediately post workout. Correct is usually and okay. It, and so in the evening, my, my argument is there's enough reason to believe that no matter what and no matter when you train, you should actually eat your carbohydrates at night. Now, I've, okay. I've made that. That's kind of my base recommendation now. I think there's enough arguments for all if we look at all the different changes going on that you can mm -hmm. always make the argu argument that you should eat your carbohydrates at night. So it's, it's not always necessarily the post-training window if you train in the morning. Um, just if you want the maximum effect of the diet, then you would want to train in the evening and have that, you know, two or three hours immediately post training that you eat the carbs. Mm -hmm. And I think Ro Rocky's argument is you should try to then go for the largest insulin spike early on in the back load. Right. And then, you know, a lower, but you know, I, I don't know how that affects things. Yeah, I don't either. I'm just saying, I'm just kind of thinking out loud based on what you're talking about in terms of that second insulin response the that following morning. You know, obviously, if you're not eating breakfast, who cares? Right. right. I'm, I'm not sure it was right. matter because, right. yeah, I believe in the in the study, they uh, it was at dinner time that they introduced the really high insulin and tropic foods. So we're talking like six or seven o'clock. Yeah. I'm not sure that would mm -hmm. matter very much. No, I mean, obviously, you're splitting right. hairs, but I'm, I'm just, you know, <laughs> right. Hypothesizing. <laughs> So, so, Bill, you know, I follow you on Twitter and I am amazed at the volume of stuff that you tweet and the time that you have to, <laughs> to find to do that. But it's kind of like getting emails from Kiefer. Like, I know what rabbit hole he's going down based on the articles <laughs> that he's requesting. And I, I can kind of see what rabbit hole you're going down based on what you're tweeting out. So uh, where do you find the time to do all of that? Uh, tweeting takes just a few seconds here and there. I mean, I'm not, I'm not always like, you know, analyzing every study that I tweet out. Sometimes I'll just, right. you know, breeze through the abstract. And if I thought it, if there was a cool quote in there, or I thought it covers an interesting topic, I'll just, you know, throw it on Twitter, see if I see if anybody wants to comment on it. So it's not, you know, I'm not always prepared to sort of answer questions about the details of each of these studies when it comes to Twitter. You know, lately I've seen you've been doing a lot on circadian rhythm. Is there anything that has struck your fancy from over the last, I don't know, three or four weeks that you've you looked at? Uh, I, yeah. I mean, the importance of sleep quality is is big with me. And I can just, just there's this one beautiful study by a scientist named Dr. Nidalcheva. I love talking about it because it was so simple. She had a couple people lose weight, all isocaloric. Everybody was eating the same diet. And then let half of them sleep for five and a half hours a night, half of them sleep for eight and a half hours a night. Diet was identical. And it was just amazing that the, the short sleepers lost way more muscle and way less fat than the long sleepers. And so that sort of is always in the forefront of my mind when it comes to the importance of 
keeping good uh, circadian rhythms and importance of sleep quality. That just that one de- detail alone can you know completely throw your you know, weight loss attempts out the window. That so now I, I've got a question on that. We're going to go down another rabbit hole. <laughs> so my. You know, that I know sleep quality has come up a lot recently. A lot of people are talking about it. A lot of people are talking about how important of it. And we have, uh, you know, just well done, simple studies like that. You know, my first question is, was it a mixed diet that they were on isocalorically? You know? Uh, yes. Mixed, mixed diet, and it was probably a high-carbohydrate diet. Okay, so here, here's my argument. Not against sleep quality or sleep quantity. I think it's important. But my argument is that it's not as important as we make out, and here's why. So if you're on a mixed diet and you are not getting enough sleep, so you, on average, your cortisol levels will rise, and we know that, you know, cortisol by itself, so let's say cortisol acting in volume, in vacuum without insulin, is actually a really great um, gluconeogenic agent, not necessarily for wasting muscle tissue, uh, but for the protein we eat. And in addition, it's it's great and very effective at um, re- helping fat tissue release fats. So we get mm-hmm. we get a good lipolytic effect from cortisol, and we get a, a I'll say healthy gl- gluconeogenic effect. And it also increases glucagon, which can help us break down glycogen stores in the liver. So cortisol in va- vacuum is not a bad hormone, but when you introduce mm-hmm. insulin. Uh, and there's a great review on the, the double, double-edged blade that cortisol is because when insulin is present, uh, we see a shift towards a lot of negative aspects of metabolism. Glucagon no longer is as effective at breaking down glycogen, but it's more effective at mobilizing protein for gluconeogenesis. And then on top of it, when cortisol and insulin are both present, those two together are very effective at helping adipose tissue both store more fat and differentiating pre-adipocytes to mature adipocytes. So my argument is if you are on a very low carb diet, like say a ketogenic diet, that you would be better capable hormonally of dealing with these deviations in sleep patterns. Now, unfortunately, I haven't seen any studies on this whatsoever. Right, but that, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if, let's just say that the, the diet that they were on in this study, if that's sort of like an insult, mm-hmm. then something like sleep quality becomes far more important if, right. you're, if your diet is poor. Okay, I can see that. Yeah, because I've noticed, you know, even when I go through periods of sleep deprivation, which I'm going through right now, um, I actually notice more fat loss than I do anything else. Um, but I'm also very, very low carb most of the time when I have to do things like that. Because of this idea, you know, I figure I've already got one insult that I'm introducing because I'm not getting a lot of sleep. So I make sure that my mm-hmm. carbohydrate loads are very, very low and minimal through the week. I was just going to say the same thing, actually. But, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, but, but along the line, same line of thought, you know, the question I was going to say, then the follow-up would be, obviously, then if you're in an ultra-low-carb state, does that really help mitigate the, the damage or the negative effect of the sleep quality or the sleep amount? So... I, and I think I would be in the same camp that probably the ultra low carb state would probably protect you from that. And obviously potentially maybe even may not make a difference depending on, you know, what level of carbohydrate intake is, is at and, and the population you're looking at. So, but obviously I'm going to guess those studies have not been done. Not to my knowledge. It's always one variable at a time. Yeah. I, th- I think it would be interesting to test that out because I, you know, I, we see ourselves, in my opinion, just because we're so sick, and obviously, uh, you know, I think the science points in the direction that we're so sick because we eat carbohydrates too often. You know, I think we mm-hmm. see ourselves as very delicate. You know, we've got to watch our stress in this. <laughs> we've got to look at our sleep. We've got to make sure we don't do this. We've got to control for this. We've got to make sure we eat every six hours. We see ourselves as so mm-hmm. delicate these days, and I. I think it's it's really because we're victims of our dietary advice. Sure. Yeah. I I agree with that. <laughs> Sorry. I I hope I, this one oh. a, a, a tangent of that is I was thinking a while back that all of the drug study, you know, I, I don't really care much for a lot of these heart medications and heart drugs personally. I hope I will never need them, but I was wondering, you know, they've been tested on people that have, you know, eaten junk their whole life 
And I guarantee that the biology in my body, you know, the enzymes, how these drugs are going to be metabolized, how they're going to affect certain biochemical pathways, that's definitely going to be different in my body than somebody else's body. So is that going to be a concern? Um, what do you mean exactly? Like if, you, if they well, were I mean, ever prescribed? Well, I mean, just what you said, like this... It, yeah, like it, well, the sleep thing, you know, sleep might be very, very important to somebody who's tortured their body for many years with, you know, poor diet. But what if somebody, you know, that, and that might be different for somebody who's very healthy, who's fit and eats well. Something sort of to bring that to the next clinical level is, well, what about, you know, drugs, dr like prescription medications? Do they need to be completely reevaluated in people that have eaten a different diet? I, I mean, I would argue yes, because... Uh, Initially, don't usually with human trials, don't we usually start with at least, you know, somewhat of a healthy population that we try them in to yeah, see like what the young healthies. Right. And then we kind of extrapolate from there. I, you know, I think, yes, that, that you can't, you can't take that first set of uh, basically, you know, if you want to call them safety studies or effect studies, I don't think those would translate into somebody who's you know, essentially their endocrine system and their metabolism and everything is so radically different than somebody who's healthy. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not sure that those really. Well, I would think that the difference here would be the safety study in a normal population versus the potential health benefit or detriment in the sick population. So again, I think, I guess it depends on what population you're looking at. Right. So yeah. I think Bill's saying, should we reassess if they're safe? Because maybe they are safe for somebody who's healthy, whose biology is functioning properly, who doesn't have all mm -hmm. these um, assaults on their metabolism. And then we're giving it to somebody who's like done nothing but assault their metabolism and body their entire life. Well, you know, I think that at least when I look at patients in my practice, it's really hard to find the patient that's truly healthy per se. I just, again, right. I'm seeing a skewed population, but I still see a lot of people uh, who Yeah, wanna, otherwise, what are they doing in your practice? Yeah, but, <laughs> right. but, but, but I still see a, a set, set of population that thinks they're healthy. And, you know, we do metabolic testing on these patients and we can, we can find significant dysfunction, you know, even though they feel normal and their blood parameters look normal. And, and so I, I would argue that it'd be difficult to find that delineation. And, and it's got to be probably someone who's very young and who, who has been kind of, so to speak, taking care of themselves uh, to find those differences. I think it'd be really hard to tease out. Mm -hmm. I, I would still argue that I think the environments are different enough that the safety studies should be done in the sick people in the first place. Oh, I would think I would agree with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. This, the very sick people that we're using them on. Yes, definitely. Right. Yeah, because right. what's funny is, was it, was it Nina's book, Nina Teicholz, where she brought up that they're thinking about recommending statins to children just in case? Well, it's been, there's oh, been geez. a push for primary prevention with statin therapy, <laughs> yes. I, I mean, you know, certainly oh, because, <laughs> because, <laughs> right. Because, I mean, look at the new oh, ACC, AHA guidelines now. It's, it's, it's predominantly pushing more toward inclusion, inclusion of more patient populations just to try to kind of uh, throw kind of everything to the wall and see what sticks, it honestly, is my personal opinion. But, but if you look at, you know, if you look at the teenage population, even toddlers nowadays, um, because of our poor diet, these pa these, these, this population group is becoming sicker and sicker and, and, and looking more like you know, adults in their 40s and 50s metabolically. And so they're coming mm -hmm. down with type 2 diabetes and they're coming down with insulin resistance. And obviously these are things that will probably over the long term predispose them to cardiovascular disease and it'll probably happen at a much earlier age. So the thinking is, yes, let's put these you know, patients on statins and mitigate the risk that potentially you can get much earlier in life. So where we normally see heart disease and patients who are 65 years of age in this subset of population, maybe you'll see it in their 20s, 30s, or 40s. So that is the thought process, yes. <laughs> so it's not that I'm against drugging children. It's just that I would, ra I would rather see it done with something like a carbose as opposed to a statin drug. Yeah, I think that would be something that would be maybe more reasonable. I mean, I, I look at the, that lipid load as, as a side effect of the diet and the side effect of the physiology. So I would think that if you can correct the glucose control issues, then you will control everything else downstream. And so, so, so using an agent that blocks the absorption of carbohydrate, I think would probably go a much longer and much 
further than just giving a, a drug that potentially hits at a level downstream as opposed to upstream and potentially could still make the glycemic issue worse. Right. That's, I, I think type 2 diabetes is a sort of a concern uh, for downstream side effect of the statin medication. Yeah. So what do you, we'll just, we're, we're getting towards the end of the show. So what, what are you currently engaged in? Are you, are, do you, are you still actively engaged in research or, you know, what is it that kind of fills uh, most yeah, of your I'm time? I'm actually spent, I'm spending a lot of time uh, working on my next book, which is going to be kind of like my first book, a lot of nutrition centric stuff, uh, information about diets. And due to my recent obsession with circadian rhythms, that plays a pretty predominant role in there. Okay, so that that's basically what you've been working on full time right I've been now. Spending a lot of time on that. Oh, lately, cool. Yeah. That'll, do you have an uh, estimated completion date? Well, it's pretty much done. I'm just doing one final revision. I'm going to start writing some letters to some publishers probably this week or next. Oh, okay. And then keep my fingers crossed. Cool. Well, good luck with that. Let us let us know how it goes. Um, anything else? Uh, I believe your website is caloriesproper.com. dot com. Um, and yep, any place else people can find you or look you up. And your your books, I know, are on Amazon. Uh, right. Yeah. Just my website, Calories Proper. And if you if you have a Twitter account, you know, I'm pretty active and I try to engage a lot there. All right. Awesome. Well. Any final wrap up? Anything you want to comment on or critique or last minute jabs, uh, just hey. in case? <laughs> <laughs> hey, this has been a great conversation. My neck, my jab will be in the next blog post. Okay, awesome. I look forward to it. <laughs> Feel free to tweet that at me when you uh, when you post that. Okay, well, I will. Awesome. Thanks for being on the show. Really appreciate it, and thanks to Rocky and Alex for for joining in this morning. And uh, that's another episode of Body IOFM. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. You've been listening to Body IOFM with your hosts, Kiefer and Dr. Rocky. If you'd like to hear more, log on to body.io. We'll be back next time with more science from the pinnacle of human health and performance.